I want to welcome everyone um, to the webinar this afternoon, uh, Disability in Media, Disability in Film. Um, it's a great pleasure to have our panels for this today, and you'll hear more about them in a moment. I just wanted to do a bit of housekeeping. Um, first off, to ask everyone to keep your microphone on mute during the presentation, uh, as it helps reduce background noise. Um, as always, you're free, free to either leave your camera on or turn it off if it makes you feel more comfortable. This session is being recorded. Um, so I know that you had to approve that when you came on, but just to let you know. Uh, a little bit about ILC for those of you who are not familiar. Uh, ILC, Independent Living Center of Waterloo Region, has been around since 1982 in Waterloo Region. We deliver a wide basket of services for people with disabilities, uh, ranging from attendance support into our community resource program. And Sherry and myself, that's where we work. Uh, and this is a part of the community, re community resource program, but also part of the virtual activities and resource program. So we're happy to have you all here. Uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to today's moderator, Sherry. Thank you so much, Dan. And thank you everyone for joining us today. So welcome to our webinar on the topic of how people with disabilities are portrayed in the media, presented by the Independent Living Center of Waterloo Region. Uh, our lead speaker will be Jeff Preston. Uh, Jeff was born with a rare neuromuscular myopathy. He has spent his life dedicated to advocating for himself and others with disabilities. He has a PhD in media studies from Western University and his research focuses on the representation of disability in popular and digital culture. He's currently an assistant professor of disability studies at King's University at Western University in London, Ontario. Also here to assist with our webinar today is Dan Harvey. He's a professional photographer and he has had some experience in small theatrical productions in Toronto. He has a master's in media studies and he's currently working on another master's of art degree at the University of Florida College of Journalism and Communications with a focus on web design. So thank you to our presenters for joining us today. Jeff, I'll now turn it over to you to begin the presentation. Um, if anybody does have questions, if you are able to put them into the chat box, uh, then we will get to the questions after Jeff's presentation. Um, if you're not able to get to, if you're not able to type them in yourself, if you want to wait until the presentation is over and ask them verbally, that is fine as well. So Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, uh, Sherry, and uh, and welcome uh, to everybody that's here. Um, great to see so many people come out to uh, to hear about such what I think is an interesting topic. Uh, but of course, I am a little biased uh, as I have a PhD in media studies with a focus on disability in media. Uh, so this is quite literally what I do, uh, more or less all day, every day. Um, so uh, adding on to to Sherry's uh, uh, introduction of me. Um, so I, uh, as I said, was born with a physical impairment, um, used a wheelchair basically my entire life. Um, and while I was growing up, I realized that what I was seeing on television and in films never really represented my life. I was seeing these characters and they felt so strange to me. I wondered whose experiences were these that they were representing? Was I maybe just not very good at being disabled or is there something more to the story? Is it perhaps that these representations are actually not about disability at all, but rather about the ways in which we imagine disability? It's that core idea that led me to do a PhD in media studies where I decided to flip the script a little bit. So rather than asking what types of things do we represent in media when it comes to disability, I wanted to try and understand what is revealed by analyzing these texts. What can we learn about the ways in which we think about, talk about, and more importantly, imagine disability? Because as it turns out, many representations of disability in popular culture until very, very recently were not created by people with disabilities, but rather were the production of non-disabled writers, non-disabled producers, directors, actors, and often then watched, revered, reviewed, and awarded by non-disabled people going to the movies, watching television, reading books, et cetera, et cetera. 
So uh, I have a little brief presentation that I want to share with you guys today, just some high level thoughts on what we typically see when we find disability in the media and what that kind of means to us as people with disabilities and what ways forward there may be. Uh, I'm aiming, I'm aiming to keep this within kind of a 15 to 20 minute. Uh, so this is going to be a, a rush job, uh, 15 minutes of about 40 years of, of academic research. Uh, so uh, I'll be spending about 30 seconds on each year. All right, so <laughs> when we look at disability in popular culture, I think in my experience that we tend to see these three main tropes, three main categories that all disabled characters seem to fall within. Disabled characters seem to either be villains or heroes or just someone to be taken care of by another main character. Now, one myth of disability disabled people are not commonly represented in media. And that's actually not totally accurate. I'm currently working on a project where I'm trying to track every representation of disability in film. And our database is already over 800 films since really the dawn of cinema that have clear identifications of disabled characters. That doesn't even begin to include disabled characters that are either not clearly identified, that have non-apparent or invisible disabilities. The list goes on and on and on. So the first real bucket that we tend to find our characters falling into is that of the hero. Now this has, I think, a real Canadian connection uh, because what other hero is there with a disability for Canadians than Terry Fox? And in many ways, Terry Fox is the iconic disabled hero, a man with an amputation, rising above himself and his impairment to do something incredible, to motivate not just the country, but the world to strive for something better, to show people that the only disability in life, quote unquote, is perhaps a bad attitude. If we move to the next slide, we'll understand that the hero mythology is rooted in what we in the Academy call the super crip model or the super crip myth. The supercrypt myth puts disability in this dichotomy. You have two essential choices. Either you rise above your impairment to become a hero, or you succumb to it to become pitiful or villainous. In these representations, then, we push disabled people to rise above their limitations, to overcome all odds. So we see this story over and over and over again, where the root of the story, the root of the film or the television show is about a disabled person who could not, who then through perseverance and practice and training and stick and gumption, rise above and become better or normal. I think tied to the supercrypt mythology is this idea of natural compensation. So we see a lot of stories where we say, well, somebody who is blind must also then have superhuman hearing, that this compensation allows them to be more normal. This is like Daredevil from Marvel Comics. We also think of things like people who are unable to hear will have heightened senses better eyes or fingers to be able to feel out the world that they're not able to hear around them. In this way, then, we reward disabled people who push aside their disabled identity and embrace the ways in which they are normal, or at least almost so. If we go to the next slide, I think I have an example that all of you will recognize. This is, of course, Stephen Hawking. And when we dig into the ways that we talk about Stephen Hawking in popular culture, we see some really interesting things. Most notably, Stephen Hawking is regularly talked about as being this disabled genius, a brilliant mind trapped, quote unquote, within a broken body. He is seen as being extraordinarily smart, despite the way in which his disability presents. Or perhaps he is actually a liar 
There is actually a whole world on the internet of people who did not believe that Stephen Hawking was actually disabled. They would argue that no one this smart could be as disabled as Stephen Hawking was. This to me seems obviously ridiculous. Um, it seems like a really, like Stephen Hawking must have gone to incredible lengths uh, to make up his disability uh, and to what end. I mean, if you are a generational talent in physics, I don't think you need a wheelchair in order to be successful. More interesting for our story though, is the way that we talked about Hawking after he died. So if many of you have, uh, if any of you have seen the film Theory of Everything, yet another award-winning film about disability not portraying by people with disabilities in the movie, we have this great scene at the end of the film in which Stephen Hawking has this fantasy. He has a dream at the end in which during a lecture, Stephen Hawking arises from his chair, walks down into the audience, picks up a pen for an attractive young woman and hands it to her. The movie ends with Hawking leaving the chair. It wasn't enough for Stephen Hawking to be brilliant, to be a genius. He had to leave the wheelchair. And so too is the way we talked about his death. Some of you may have seen a very popular image. It was a cartoon, started online, was then published in newspapers. An image in which Stephen Hawking is seen walking into the cosmos, leaving his wheelchair behind. Even in death, Stephen Hawking's heroic story can only end with him leaving his wheelchair behind, casting off the skin of disability to reveal the normalcy within, the desire to not be disabled anymore, which I don't think actually represents Stephen Hawking and his reality, certainly not the way that he talked about his disability anyways. So while some may say, well, what's the big deal? It's a good thing that we talk about heroes. It's a good thing that we celebrate disabled people and their many accomplishments. Of course, there are problems though with this form of representation. If we go to the next slide, you'll note that many of these representations are often rooted deeply in ideas of pity or paternalism. How many of you have seen a news report about disabled person does X and the X is something completely mundane. Like disabled person graduates high school. Disabled person shoots a hoop in a basketball game. Disabled person merely exists. What we do is we tend to lower the bar of accomplishment for disabled people and then celebrate things that are otherwise mundane. I myself have been told that I am brave while being at the grocery store. That is a really weird thing to say to somebody when they're grocery shopping. I have been told repeatedly at bars, it's good to see you out. Out from where, I wonder? Prison, perhaps? No, probably a hospital or my home. But it's celebrated that I'm doing something which often, particularly for undergrad students, we do not see as a celebratory event. Going to the bar is often not a thing that makes someone a hero. There's also a real fear for the reduction of accommodation requirements. If a disabled person can merely try hard enough, then why bother with any accessibility? If you can hear and see with your ears, if you're blind, if you have superhuman abilities with a wheelchair, then why bother with things like ramps and elevators? Disabled people will merely find their way to overcome. That is what we are thought to be able to do. This also though places an enormous pressure on disabled people to perform. How many of you have felt as though there was a huge pressure on you to be incredible? If you're not Terry Fox and you're disabled, then what are you? Perhaps a failure, a failed disabled person, unable to inspire the non-disabled people around us. And if we aren't able to inspire people, we are then thought to not really have much value at all. I think advocate uh, and disability rights advocate, uh, Pat Evans uh, said it perhaps best that at first sight, this meaning the hero trope will seem preferable to their pity, but or being written off as an invalid. But all we will achieve is the status of a performing sea lion and not readmittance 
to their rank. The hero does not become normal, but rather becomes an object or a tool to the benefit of the non-disabled viewer. This is where we get the phrase inspiration porn from. Porn being that there is a certain sense of pleasure for non-disabled people to see disabled people achieving things they didn't think were possible. But what happens if you aren't a hero? What happens if you aren't able to rise above and beyond? If we go to the next slide, we will get our answer. Typically, if we can't overcome our impairment, we are doomed to then be the villain. Now, I don't want to go into a huge tangent right now, but I do want to identify that very, very few people identify or think of Captain Hook as a disabled character, despite the fact that he is quite literally named after his disability. He is Captain Hook because he has a hook, because his hand was bitten off by a crocodile. This hook then becomes the center of his identity, and he is then driven to try to murder children in order to get back at them for the loss of his hand and the acquiring of his pretty honestly badass hook. Now, some people may argue that Captain Hook is actually about growing up, it's about adulthood, it's not about disability, but he is literally called Captain Hook. Very regularly, he is framed by his hook, as we see in this image, um, quite literally looking through it. Captain Hook's world is formed by his disability. He sees the world through it. And the, what he sees is a world that must pay. So what does the villain typically look like? Well, villainous representations aren't as common now as they used to be. But if we move forward a slide, Generally, the villain tends to come in two different kinds of flavors, either the criminal or the monster. These are ideas from Paul K. Longmore, an American academic. The criminal generally sees disability as being emblematic of the individual's evil, that their physical appearance of difference is reflective of a dangerous or corrupted mind that these individuals have endured disability either as a punishment for their sins, they were bad people and so they became disabled as retribution, or that because they haven't overcome their disability, they are left to be bitter and resentful, that they don't like the fact that other people are able to walk or able to talk or able to see or hear or think in ways different than them. And it's this bitter resentment that turns them to crime or to violence. Ultimately, this is rooted in the, what I would say, blaming the victim, that we see the victim as not adapting correctly to their disability and therefore not being a good person. It should no, we should note and be aware of the fact that one of the main ways that we try to delegitimize disability advocates and activists is by calling them bitter. We say, oh, I really would like to go to school, but school is just not accessible. And the response is, you're just bitter. Stephen Hawking has a PhD. What's your problem? This is a little different than the monster. The monster is quite literally grotesque, disfigured, deformed, often seen in horror movies or science fiction. We generally see this then as external difference being a sign of internal deformity, that the disability is the cause for doing evil or the punishment for doing evil. In both these instances, the criminal and the monster, the general solution, the solve for this problem is death. We tend to kill off these characters in popular culture or when not able to kill them off, we attempt to rehabilitate them. We put them in asylums or in jail where we hope to cure them of their disability. A great example recently of this, I would say, if we flip forward, is the film Split. Now Split is the second movie in a trilogy, uh, which is basically the bad news for disability trilogy made by M. Night Shyamalan. And I'm gonna put a giant asterisk beside that comment because if you can find me a good 
M. Night Shyamalan movie that doesn't completely ridicule disabled people, I would love to be corrected. But basically every single one of his films is rooted in disability as being scary. In Split, the middle movie, uh, Kevin, or The Beast, is a man with disassociative identity disorder. One of his identities being this ultra-violent beast character who literally wants to eat young women. This is a prime example of disabled villains being seen as animalistic or not quite human. The beast is often crawling on all fours, bulging muscles, veins popping out, the lacks reason or compassion. Kevin is seen as out of control, wholly corrupted by his mental illness and therefore a threat to everyone around him. The solution in M. Night Shyamalan's opinion is at first institutionalization and eventually that does not work. And so death is the only way to protect the normals. Last but certainly not least, we have a representation of the burden. If you're not a hero and you're not a villain, in popular culture, if you're disabled, you then are probably a burden, or what I would like to call the Tiny Tim syndrome. Tiny Tim is, I think, my mortal nemesis. Um, I don't know that Charles Dickens knew that I would exist when he wrote the story. I'm going to assume he did, and he made this character purely to anger and frustrate me for my entire life. Tiny Tim is like the emblem of disabled people. He is the, please sir, can I have some more? Which I know is not Tiny Tim, but it's basically the same thing. So when we look at disability then as a burden, we typically see a world of anxiety. If we move forward a slide. We see disability then as harboring some sort of difficulty, that it's tough to be disabled, that people are mean to disabled people very regularly, and that like children, disabled people are fundamentally dependent on all of those around them. That friends and family and doctors and nurses and just kind people on the street must provide care for disabled people at all times because like a child, they are unable to care for themselves. In some ways then, I wonder if the burden representation is about drawing a line between normalcy and disability by saying there are normal people in the world and there are also disabled people in the world. Two categories that are different, that must be kept separate in which the non-disabled must care for these poor, sick children, Tiny Tim. Within this, we also tend to see a collapsing of disability impairment condition, a universalizing. So often in these representations, one disability means lots of disabilities. So if you use a wheelchair, you probably also have a cognitive impairment. You might think or act like a child or be irresponsible. You might not be able to hear as well or have a seeing problem. It's also not uncommon when we start to blend disabilities. So they'll say, oh, this is a character who has I don't know, cerebral palsy, but it actually looks a lot like a spinal cord injury with like a little touch of spina bifida mixed in there. They just kind of blast them all together and say, well, that seems close enough. Not really caring about the disability itself, but rather caring about the function of the disabled character. Within these stories then, disabled people must be contained. They must fall under the power of the parent the parent must care for them, must have authority over them. And if there is no parent, then they must fall under the care of medical geniuses, doctors who will control them, will help them, and will hopefully transcend them into the hero role. These stories then tend to draw a hard line around segregation, this idea that disabled people are happier when they're on their own. Whether that's right or wrong is perhaps hard to say. But an obvious example of this representation, if we go forward one, is of course the award-winning and trend-setting film, Rain Man, featuring our character, Raymon, one of the very early representations of autism in film. This story essentially is wrapped up around the conflict between Tom Cruise's character needing to care for his disabled brother, Raymond. 
And of course, by the end of the film, we all learn a good lesson in compassion. Tom Cruise stops being a jerk, kind of, in order to be a brother, more so a caregiver to his other brother. They all learn a lesson in humanity and we all become better people. Again, in Rain Man and many movies like it, disability then becomes a moment to learn from, for disabled people to become better people through their interactions with disability. This isn't the only story though that we tell about disability and particularly in the last decade, we have seen a huge change in the ways in which we represent and talk about disability in popular culture. If we move forward one slide, we'll get to my new category, a category which I refer to as subversive disability or subversive representations, perhaps most recently seen in the character Zach in the film, Peter Butter Falcon. I think if we go forward, core to these representations is that we are for the first time starting to empower disabled people to tell their own stories, to talk about the world in the way that they see it. What this means is that by representing ourselves, we're starting to get more authentic representation of disability, more critical representations. So we have people like Zach Anner, for instance, a man who started a uh, very popular YouTuber at first. Uh, he uh, entered a contest for the Oprah network um, to get his own show on Oprah's TV channel. Um, he was robbed uh, and did not win that competition. Uh, internet folks discovered that he was robbed and started to harass Oprah. Uh, and Oprah would then overturn her decision and give him a show as well. But more significant than that, because his show was canceled almost immediately, uh, was that he was then hired to write for a show called Speechless, uh, a reasonably popular show recently canceled on ABC about a family with a boy who has a disability, which in many ways breaks many of these stereotypes and actually satirizes them, mocks the way that we think and talk about disability in popular culture. We have people like Sarah Kane, uh, a playwright who wrote 4.48 Psychosis, uh, writing about her own experiences with mental illness. Uh, 4.48 obviously is an award-winning uh, award play. We also have older people like Marley Matlin. Uh, she broke the, the deaf barrier in cinema uh, in her role in Children of a Lesser God, uh, was then later added into the series Switched at Birth, which is a really popular show that seeped in deaf culture uh, and is now in uh, the award winning era, sorry, record breaking sale of the film Coda. Uh, Coda, which is about children of parents who are deaf, uh, was a huge hit at Sundance and Apple TV just purchased the rights for the most that any movies have been purchased from Sundance for, I think $25 million, something like that. So uh, if you wanna become a millionaire, make a movie about disability that doesn't suck. We also have people like Joyner Lucas. Uh, he's a musician, a rapper, who's talked very publicly about ADHD and talks about the ways in which ADHD isn't necessarily always a drawback, that in the right field and the right conditions and the right environments, he excels perhaps because of the way his brain functions differently. Uh, he released an album called ADHD, which really overtly challenges the medical definitions and interventions into the world of ADHD. And last but certainly not least, we have people like Aaron Phillips, uh, a trans actor, model, Instagram, social media, all-star, that's really pushing the ways in which we think and define bodies and beauty and acceptance. These people, among with a huge constellation of other disabled people who are starting to tell our story as opposed to falling within these narrow, rigidly defined categories that we typically see, are fundamentally changing the ways that we think and talk about disability. That as these texts become more popular, more accepted, new stereotypes, new categories, and new understandings of disability are slowly starting to take hold. So I think there is some light at the end of this otherwise relatively dark tunnel, but perhaps at the core of it lies that old famous disability rights slogan nothing about us without us. Stories about disability should be informed by, told by, performed by people with impairments. 
Because after all, it's our story, not theirs. So that's what I've prepared for you today in a formal sense. But I really wanted to make sure that we had time to talk more, uh, to, to talk candidly about what we see and how we feel about it and what we maybe could do about it differently. And even more important, I want you to hear from someone smarter than me, uh, Dan Harvey, who's had some real experience and not just experience behind the keyboard. So I am gonna stop talking right now and take a drink. And uh, yeah, let's get a conversation going. That was wonderful, Jeff. Thank you so much. Um, very informative. I learned a lot. Um, I know that Dan, you know, he, he isn't a big uh, talker, but I would love it if he could share just a little bit about his experience, um, you know, both on stage and maybe behind the camera as well. He's been in both roles um, as a person with a disability. So if you wouldn't mind, Dan, sharing just a tiny bit about um, your insight, because you've you've been on both sides of things, um, that would be wonderful. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Yes, okay. Um, yeah, so as uh, Sherry had mentioned, um, I have had a little bit of experience uh, in my real life. Uh, I'm not necessarily a card carrying member of ACTRA or anything, um, but I have had some experience uh, working on a production in Toronto on a theatrical play a few years ago. And in that process, I um, was introduced to a number of people who um, are showing that representations of disability are certainly um, things that pretty much anyone can do if you literally put your pen to a piece of paper and want to make it happen. So I know a lot of people um, tend to kind of grumble and um, not necessarily suggesting that Jeff was grumbling today. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, as Jeff kind of ended his presentation um, saying that uh, nothing about us without us um, is extremely true because I think obviously we know how to represent ourselves um, as people with disabilities. And I think that if someone has a story to tell that they think can be something worthwhile or um, a piece of theater, a piece of um, cinema or anything, uh, just any type of art, <laughs> express yourself in some way uh, is something that anyone can really do. I think that's the only uh, deterrent really is uh, people themselves in many ways. Um, and some people might see hurdles in the industry, whether that's funding uh, initiatives, because um, obviously Hollywood, even though Hollywood, I don't know, I think, I think poorly of them many times because of various reasons, but obviously Hollywood is only going, when, only going to fund projects that they know that they will have a return on investment. And sometimes certain stories that aren't going to pull at your heartstrings and follow certain stereotypes might not be that return on investment some studios might be looking for. Um, but I think people are now realizing that uh, certain stories, if they are good stories, they make great entertainment and uh, you can make money off of anything good, I guess. Um, so yeah, I think my long rambling speech of whatever I'm talking about right now, it's just basically saying if you want to make something, the only uh, barrier, I suppose, is uh, our own uh, our own lack of going out and doing it, basically, because um, as I've mentioned, I've done the theater stuff, and I know many people who are in theater productions, and obviously right now the theater world is not the best place to be during a pan pandemic, um, but whenever the situation starts to clear up, hopefully people can get back into the theater and do various things. And uh, I know I'm gonna continue to make 
pictures of various types of various people and whether that's people with disabilities or people who don't have disabilities. Um, yeah, it's just get involved in some way, I guess. Anyway, I'll stop rambling. <laughs> No, you're certainly not rambling, Dan. Um, you have lots of awesome insight there. I really appreciate you sharing your experience. Um, yeah, I think I think you're totally right. I think a lot of the time it's we're scared, right? Like we're nervous, and maybe we've come across people as dis with disabilities have come across so many barriers in like everyday life that we just think this is there's just going to be too many hurdles. It's going to be too hard to do stuff. So you're not wrong. Um, I think we do have to just um, yeah, like with everything else, I mean, we're kind of used to having to fight for stuff, right? So you might have to to fight to if that's if that's what you want to do. Um, yeah, so we're going to open up the floor to questions and and you know any sort of conversation you want to have going that would be great. Um, if you want, if you're not comfortable speaking or you want to send your question in through the chat box, that's great. And Dan Lejoie was going to um, read out any questions that we had. Um, come in so far. So Dan, if you have any questions there that you are able to read out at this point, and then if you, people want to add them in or jump in and communicate, that'd be great. Yeah, that's that's great, Sherry. Actually, I do have some questions that have come in. And um, before I read those, I do want to um, sort of uh, echo what you said and, and thank Jeff and Dan for presenting. Um, it's really informative and um, film is a bit of a passion of mine, so it's great to hear um, your perspective. So we have a few questions come in um, and I'll just, I'll read them and give either one of you a chance to respond. Uh, and as Sherry said, if you have questions yourself, feel free to sort of raise your hand uh, either physically or, or through Zoom um, and then and verbalize uh, or send it to me in chat. So the first question, do you have any tips on how to balance between being proud of your accomplishments as a disabled person and playing into inspiration porn? For example, on social media, et cetera. Uh, that's a really good question. A really good question. And I it, it's one that I, I struggle with, right? Like when we think about inspiration porn, you know, the the jury, so to speak, uh, the, the public minds talking from, from a disability perspective, all tend to agree inspiration porn is universally bad. Uh, but there's a complexity there. So for instance, there are a lot of Paralympic athletes whose like financial well-being is dependent on their ability to be inspirational after they're done being Paralympic athletes. Like we don't really pay Paralympic athletes very well. And it's not like uh, other Olympic athletes who are then able to cash in afterwards and you know sign endorsement deals and that sort of thing. It's not like that for Paralympic athletes. And so instead, what a lot of them do is they then become inspirational speakers. Uh, and so they are like, yeah, I know I'm kind of falling into this trap, but I also need to secure the bag. So I'm going to go get that money. And if people want to pay me for this, uh, that's on them. Uh, so at least I'm benefiting from it financially. Um, so I, I, I think there's some nuance there. There's some complexity to it. But I think at the end of the day, what I think it really comes down to is, is, is two things. I think number one, it is almost impossible for disabled people to not be inspiring at some point in their life, whether or not they intend it to be. It's like, you can be the most boring person in the world and someone will be inspired by you merely for you existing. Uh, it, it's just sort of a reality. Um, and you know, maybe enjoy that for what it is. But I would say the other side of it is, is thinking about the things that you're doing and thinking about the, uh, the accomplishments and the achievements that you are uh, not just making, but then celebrating and asking yourself, am I doing this for me? Is this something that I am proud of? Is this something that I want to do? Is it something that I am really impressed the, by the fact that I was able to do it? And if the answer is yes, if this is you doing this for you, um, then go to it, honestly. I say celebrate it. And people are going to do whatever they're going to do with it out the other side of it. But I would start to wonder and start to ask yourself, how much of your life are you doing things because it's you believe it's expected of you, that you're trying to fit within this archetype that's been laid out for all of us, and asking, is that actually something I really want to do? Is that something that I actually enjoy? 
or am I sort of doing it because I feel like there's this kind of quiet pressure to do it? And if, if that's the case, if you don't like it, uh, then I say, don't do it. But there are so many things in this world that you can do and spend your time on, way too many things. Um, why not do the things that actually, you know, fill your soul uh, as opposed to the things that are just seem obligatory? It's a terrible answer. I apologize. <laughs> that was a great answer. Yeah, it is a great answer, Jeff. And um, what you said there about the pressure and what you'd said before about, you know, feeling like you have to be exceptional. Like I remember when I first started playing wheelchair basketball within weeks of playing, people were asking me when I was going to go to the Olympics. And I was like, what? Like, in what? <laughs> like, if it, you know, if a 20 year old picks up a basketball, you're going to ask them when they're, oh, when are you going to get in the NBA? Like, it just doesn't make sense. Right. So that um, pressure on us to be exceptional. Um, yeah, can kind of influence what we put out there, you know, on social media and stuff like that. So look at me, I got my life together. Like, it doesn't matter that I can't walk. It doesn't matter, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, I don't let that bother me, but obviously that's not the, you know, that's not reality in day in and day out of someone living with a disability. So um, we do sometimes have to paint that rosy picture to make, you know, everyone happy, I guess. <laughs> And I myself fall in that trap a little bit, and I'm going to try to, to dial it back. <laughs> I, think, I think the other thing I would add to that is uh, I'm less concerned about people celebrating their accomplishments. I'm more concerned about the people that censor themselves on the bad stuff. Um, I think that us disabled people, uh, we have a righteous indignation uh, that I think we need to share more commonly, more loudly, more vocally, and not be afraid of being accused of being bitter. Um, I will be a bitter, bitter cripple for as long as I need to be so that the next generation doesn't have to be as bitter. Um, so I say, embrace that anger. It's okay, you're not the problem. Think about the ways in which you have been disabled by uh, the worlds in which you have been born into, the structures of which have been built around you or built even before you arrived on this planet um, and, and let that indignation sing because it is righteous in nature. That's great, thanks. I just have a question um, for Dan. It says, when you are showcasing your work, do you identify as a person with disability as a means to promote your product? That is a great question. Um, because um, I don't, part, of, part of my answer will be um, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, um, but I do, I don't know. I think I'm at a period right now where I'm more um, just showcasing what I'm working on just for the sake of it being art not connected to my disability. Um, I think I was uh, in a place about four or five years ago where I um, was perhaps almost using my dis disability as a quote unquote crutch for lack of a better uh, metaphor uh, to try and create things. And I was creating things that I actually didn't feel fulfilled with. So maybe even going back to Jeff's response is uh, um, I found creating things that, or A, well, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm not someone who, who likes like tooting my own horn and talking about myself and, and things like that. So it also depends on the person's like personality. And uh, so I myself, I like, letting the things I'm working on speak for themselves. And I think for the past two years, I've just liked making things that I thought were nice pieces of art, whether it's photographs or anything else. And uh, I don't necessarily connect them to my disability, um, but I still look for avenues sometimes because I still feel a connection to the community and people with disabilities and I still want 
uh, sort of the idea that I'm a person with a disability making something, not just like, oh, that's an inspirational thing. It's just like, that's something that someone does and it, it may not necessarily go completely unseen um, so that whatever stereotypes that still exist, um, even though I'm not directly going out to prove them wrong, but I'm somehow like subversive, like just because I'm doing something, trying to prove to people that people with disabilities can do whatever they want, depending, it doesn't have to do anything with their disability or anything. So I have given you a very long answer to <laughs> uh, a very good question. Um, so yeah, it just, it really depends on what I'm working on and, and what my objective is at the end of the day. But I think um, I'm never, well, I'm never without my disability. I wake up every morning with it and it's still connected to me and my wheelchair's with me everywhere I go. So I'm never completely without it. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, and I still like think about projects that I would still like to do with um, uh, various like realms of disability or in the disabled community. Um, I started a project a few years ago with Sherry that I never finished and I started it and Sherry was my first subject and I think about going back to it sometimes and I hope I will one day. Um, but yeah, so long to short answer is yes and no. <laughs> Well, wow, that's a great one. I think that's probably a pretty common answer for a lot of people with disabilities, you know? Yes and no. Sometimes I identify and sometimes I'm just one of the crowd, right? So I think that's a great answer, Dan. Thank you. Um, I've got one here. It's sort of a combination uh, of a couple of different questions that came in. So uh, I'll read this one here. It's a, it's a little long question, but um, it captures the sentiment. So why do you think people with disabilities in film are so often portrayed by people without disabilities. Is there less talent with disabilities to choose from? Or is it too difficult to make movie sets, theaters, et cetera, accessible for actors and performers with disabilities? Can I kind of jump in on this one? Absolutely. I have a lot of opinions. I have a lot of opinions on this. I'm gonna try not to go on for like an hour. Um, okay, so there are basically two answers here, in my opinion. There is, a the sort of the story as it's been told and then i think that is there's the reality which is somewhere in the middle um so the story as it is told um hollywood argues that uh it is very difficult to incorporate disabled people into film or television sets so they will say well but but what if the set is inaccessible? How do we get them on there? What about the changing room? Oh, well, it's very complicated. People have to change their um, costumes all the time. And yeah, like, where's the aid gonna be to change them? Do we need a changing table? This is way too complicated. I mean, our budget is only $500 million. How could we ever do this? Um, so that's sort of the one side of the story. <laughs> um, and then also it's like, huh, why aren't there disabled actors? Well, often because disabled people can't get into acting schools. Why can't they get into acting schools? Because acting schools say, well, there aren't any disabled roles and also we're not accessible. So sorry. Um, so there's this, this like pipeline that doesn't exist for disabled people in the same way. And then there's the other reality that um, many producers and writers and that have a limited imagination apparently and they can't imagine how you would have a story that was written for a non-disabled character and how you could just drop in a disabled person into that role um so like how could you just have Romeo and Juliet and have Juliet be a person with down syndrome how could you do that uh you couldn't you would have to address it and if you're addressing it, then it's not Romeo and Juliet anymore. Now it's Romeo and girl with Down syndrome. Um, and so I think that that's sort of the, that's the message that we hear typically from Hollywood people, Hollywood folks, or also they're just like, I don't know any disabled people. Um, that's another very common one. Um, I think the reality though, is obviously a lot more complex. 
I think obviously just straight up ableism um, and just not understanding um, anything about the world. Uh, it doesn't help that people like Clint Eastwood, uh, who yes, made the film Million Dollar Baby, which basically kills off a disabled character, uh, also sued the government over the Accessibility for Disabilities Act. He tried to stop accessibility from happening. And Clint Eastwood is kind of a big deal in Hollywood. So, you know, when you have these sort of leaders actively trying to keep disabled people out, not just out of cinema, but literally out of all of America, um, you've got a bit of a problem, I would say. And I think the other side is that disabled people are, are not seen as agentic. Uh, they don't have agency. They're not seen as having really valuable or important ideas or stories. And therefore, just as disabled people are segregated out in the real world and are placed into disabled spaces, we have the real Olympics, and then we have the Paralympics. We have the you know, real Olympics and the special Olympics. Um, we place disabled people aside and we draw these sort of harsh lines. So then disabled people are just the other. They're just out there in the world, away from us, the normal, that are generally populated the worlds of cultural production. And so then what happens is we see disabled people and say, oh, I should incorporate that in my film. Well, how would I do it? Well, disabled people have hard lives. They're struggling. It's sad to be disabled. Okay, so that's how they'll be in my show or that's how they'll be in my movie. And it just sort of gets like plunked in um, as you know, Mitchell and Snyder call it narrative prosthesis uh, where the disabled person is the crutch to allow the movie to move forward. It's like, why is um, Leonardo DiCaprio in What's Eating Gilbert Grape? He, his character is literally there to be a humanizing element for Gilbert Grape, the other character, John Depp's character. So, um, so they become a tool in this way. Um, and I think last, but certainly not least, it's that cultural industries are extremely reproductive in nature. What has been done once has to be done over and over and over and over and over again, because people don't really have original ideas. They just take old good ideas and redo it over and over until it doesn't make money anymore. So you have Rain Man comes out, it's a huge deal. And so then everyone's like, well, now we need to make our Rain Man. So you get I Am Sam and all these other films that are just like Rain Man. And part of the reason for that is when they start doing screen tests, if you have a character that doesn't look or act like Rain Man, the audience now says, well, that's not autism. I know what autism is. It's about counting and it's about having these savant characteristics and having catchphrases. And if it's not those things, it's not real and it breaks the reality of the film. And so in the same way that as a child, I saw representations of disability and was like, that's not how we are. It's actually the other way around for people that don't have experience with disability, that those representations become the true accurate representation. And anything that goes against it then seems fake or wrong or overly politicized and is then not interested anymore. Um, and so it doesn't get picked up. And I think all of those tensions are coming together. That, and that's, I think, a major thing that we're trying to fight against uh, when it comes to production. That was a long answer. I apologize. I just got very excited by this topic. <laughs> That's great. I, Thanks, Jeff. I think I think the actually the other part that you could add to this is uh, this isn't necessarily something new. Um, the the world of acting, humans have been playing other people and other characters for hundreds of years, and three or four hundred years ago, um, it actually wasn't okay for women to be actors and men were acting, pretending to be women on stage. And then about a hundred years ago, um, if you were a member of a certain race, uh, you also weren't acting. People were painting their skin black or yellow or various other colors to represent other races. Um, so people pretending to have disabilities um, can certainly fall into these other camps of um, actors pretending to be other people. Um, and that's sort of one of the minor issues with why um, a lot of people are still doing it. And um, part of it is going to the craft of acting. Um, you have some people um, 
like uh, I'm blanking on his name, the dad from Malcolm in the Middle. Jeff, help me. Um, Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston. He uh, redid uh, the the Intouchables a few years ago, and he played the main uh, individual who had a spinal cord injury. And when he was asked um, what he felt about portraying a person with a disability, even though he doesn't have a disability. Um, his main answer is, I'm an actor. We are paid to pretend to be someone we're not. And that's what I do for a living. Like, that's what we do. Um, so it doesn't matter if I have a disability. Um, every day, he says, I get up and my job is to pretend to not be me. Um, so it doesn't make a difference whether or not I have a disability or not. And so this seems to be also an argument that um, a lot of people just in the theater world or the acting world um, will continue to use. And it's hard to argue against it because there's this long standing um, uh, belief that acting is this like cherished uh, art form that uh, people should be able to uh, portray anyone they want if they're method actors or whatever, if they're Joaquin Phoenix and pretending to be uh, John, what's his last name? John. Um, Calhoun. What's his last What is it? Calhoun. Yeah, John Calhoun. Um, this, like, these happen all the time. And uh, I don't necessarily think it's going to stop anytime soon. Um, but uh, I think it will stop when more and more people with disabilities um, continue to apply to theater programs and continue to get agents um, and more and more people just see people with disabilities acting because I know they can. Um, I know people who can and they just need an agent and the chance. Um, but Hollywood's Hollywood and there are a bunch of narcissists that think that everything should be uh, perfect and even just the culture of Hollywood is really gross when you think about it with whether it's plastic surgery or just the way people are supposed to look everyone's supposed to look perfect so even the idea of having a dis disabled character that might look kind of different is not something that they want to put on their movie poster because everyone's supposed to look perfect and whatever. Anyway, so I think it's just deeply ingrained in the culture of acting um, that uh, hopefully one day will be busted open. Um, I'm not holding my breath for it because it's a mess, <laughs> but uh, I know one of these days, some people will start breaking through and they already have, uh, I know, a variety of actors that are slowly breaking through. And I think actually the key is not looking at Hollywood and getting away from these like major, like really gross theater or uh, producers and look at some indie films and um, look at all these independent productions that are coming out because uh, they're way better, <laughs> they're smarter, uh, their storylines are less garbage and whatever. So. I don't know. Again, long answer, but <laughs> that's great. Thanks. I, I, I want to pick up on on something I think Dan said that that is that is really important. Um, it's in, it's important for us to realize that it is very unlikely that a female character will be will have a physical disability. There are very very few representations of females with physical disabilities. Why? Because female characters with disabilities tend to have mental illness. They tend to be hysterical or depressed or crazy in some way. And I think this goes to Dan's point around this, like the image and beauty. Um, the, uh, as you know, Laura Mulvey will say, the objective or the reason for a woman to be in a film is for to be sexy, to be beautiful, uh, to be looked upon. And you wouldn't want to corrupt that by putting them then in a wheelchair. Uh, you know, I have friends of mine that are women that are in wheelchairs regularly are told, it's such a shame, you're so pretty. Uh, it's, so, it's a shame that you're in a wheelchair. And it's like, 
as though these two things cannot coexist. Um, and then we put men in wheelchairs because the story is about how strong men are broken down by, uh, by physical impairment. Um, and Vietnam, Vietnam was another reason for that. That's a whole other, that's a whole other guest lecture. Sherry could bring me back and we could talk about Vietnam and gender and disability. That's awesome. I love it. Um, I think we have a question from Leanne. She's had her hand up for a little bit. Thank you. Can you hear me? Cool. Um, I'm curious about the data that Jeff has been collecting. I, I think you said it was film representation and um, you had hundreds of, of samples. Um, I'm guessing that more often than not, disability is located sort of as an individual characteristic, although I'd be happy to be wrong about that. Um, and I'm wondering if any or of uh, those would be um, located as a sort of social category and a follow up to that, if ever then it is interrogated or only ever sort of reproduced. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the database program or project is, it's still early days. Um, however, it is going to be public uh, and searchable. Uh, and so one of the main dreams of the database is that, that people, whoever, will then be able to go in and try doing different searches to look for different patterns. Um, and so there's certain patterns that I'm looking for, uh, but we want the data set to then be accessible to people um, because there is no actual gathering of this type of list. It's like, I've seen lots of different random lists, but often they're category specific. It's like, here's 50 movies of blindness or here's 20 movies of wheelchair users. Um, and so we're trying to bring it all together. Um, so it's, it's still really early days, but generally speaking, there are some really obvious trends. So um, little people uh, are, are very, very common, almost not exclusively, but almost exclusively in horror, sci-fi and comedy, for instance, because they are generally either uh, the punchline of the film, they're sort of a joke character, like the court jester stereotype, or uh, they're scary. Um, you know, I think of like Leprechaun, for instance, uh, literally about killer leprechauns uh, played by little people. Um, that's one trend that is becoming very apparent. Uh, and, and the categories do seem to sort of trend, as I said, you know, women tend to be more on the non apparent um, side. Deaf as well. Uh, a lot of deaf women um, is another really common one. Uh, as well, because it, it's sort of played off as a sort of allure. It's like, oh, they're exotic. They don't hear, they speak a different language. Um, and that's like part of the sexual attraction. Um, so Children of a Lesser God, a great example of that. Um, and so uh, we're hoping to start to be able to differentiate those types of things and to see. But I think to Dan's point, what we are seeing is the further you get away from the mainstream, the more likely it is that the representation is informed by disabled people, either they were writers or they were actors within the text. Uh, and also the more likely it is to represent what we would call a social model of disability perspective. Um, as you say, sort of more of a social construction as opposed to uh, toward to health. And that is also like within the last like 10 years, um, basically like it, there's not a lot of that in the nineties. Uh, it's not really until kind of the 2000s, like, Rory O'Shea was here would be kind of a, an early example. Um, yeah, but you start to see like over reference to like the disability rights movement. Um, yeah, so there seems to be a bit of a temporal nature, a lot more villains in the 80s, a lot more inspiration in the 90s, um, probably as a response to the villains. People are like, stop portraying us as villains. So they're like, okay, then you're heroes. Um, so I think that's sort of the way that this tends to work. It's so much of it is response to response to response. Um, but yeah, so once the database is up and running, hopefully we'll have a kind of a big to do, um, but I'll make sure to let uh, Sherry and Dan know. Uh, and so then uh, they can push it out as well. And hopefully you'll see once it's up line and uh, you can start doing some searches. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question. Um, this came in and uh, I recently saw an episode of a show where one of the secondary characters, a doctor, was deaf and used a tablet with an interpreter on video call to communicate with her colleagues. 
I thought it was really interesting because it wasn't the focus of the character's story, just the fact of her life. Do portrayals like this example give you hope that the industry is changing and persons with disabilities will be portrayed more realistically in media moving forward? Do you want to tackle this, Dan? Nope. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. It absolutely gives me hope. Um, I think it's great that we're starting to just inject disabled characters. They're just there, just because, because there are disabled people in this world. Uh, you know, it's like, I would argue probably close to 20% of our population has some form of impairment, uh, either temporary or chronic. And so, uh, of course, they should be there. Uh, I, we are seeing this a lot more commonly that people are, are allowing it just to exist. I think when we talk about the response and that sort of cause and effect of these things, I wonder though, if we will essentially start to wipe out disability then as a character trait, um, if we'll become afraid to tell stories that embrace the disability. Um, like I look at a movie like uh, Peanut Butter Falcon and if Peanut Butter Falcon ignored Zach's Down syndrome, if it was literally just a buddy film about two guys that run away, I don't think that film is actually as good. I think part of what made that film really good was that it embraced Zach as someone with Down syndrome. And it was like, yeah, that's a part of who he is. It's an important part and it's a good part of who he is. Um, and so I think it's about trying to find that balance between these two poles to say, you know, uh, you look at somebody like Peter Dinklage, uh, he gets hired to play what was originally a non-disabled character in Days of Future Past. And he's just there as a, as a little person. Um, and that's not a part of the story. And that I think is extremely progressive and radical in some ways. But I also think that it's important for us to, to continue to build disability culture um, and to find pride in and connection in the ways in which we are bound together, not necessarily by our difference, but bound together by the ways in which we are imagined as different by, by the majority. Uh, by the non-disabled or those who haven't discovered yet that they are or will be disabled at some point. Um, I think that that culture, I think, is really important. And I think it's good because it reveals that the world as it stands right now is not good uh, th and that there are different ways of living. Um, I think disability offers a radical indictment on the ways in which we have built the current world, the current Canada that we live in as a place that isn't right and needs to be better. And disabled people perhaps have some of those answers. Uh, and that comes out of this sort of culture that gets built between us. Um, so I think we wanna try and balance it. Um, embrace and be proud of when we can and also just be present when we can because that's more true to reality. Well, listen, everyone, I wanna thank everyone for coming out. I wanna extend a thank you to Sherry who helped make the connection uh, with Jeff and with Dan. Uh, of course, I want to thank our panelists, Jeff and Dan. Um, you've given us a lot to think about today and uh, I look forward to uh, hearing more about the database moving forward. That sounds um, really intriguing. Um, folks, I mean, uh, if you want to stay connected to some of our other webinars that we do, I would encourage you to either email Sherry or myself um, at the Independent Living Center. We can connect you with our weekly email list uh, which often says what's happening. Um, but other than that, I wanna thank everyone for coming out uh, and again, enjoy the rest of your day and look forward to hearing more about the database.